Good evening. Welcome to a special midweek episode of the Irish NFL show. A break from the norm in terms of reviewing games and previewing games. And tonight we have a very special guest, a returning guest to the show who was on with us in January last year. Two times Super Bowl champion, two times kicking the Giants to Super Bowl. LT has great fondness for this side of the world, having grown up in Scotland, a Celtic fan. You're very welcome back to the Irish NFL show, LT. Thank you guys for having me. It, 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 did you guys enjoy the World Cup? The U.S. made it out of the group stage. Um, so I thought that was important. And then, obviously, what a World Cup final. See, that's my first love is the real football, not the American football. But um, it was good to see the Yanks advance. Um, I, but I that World the, Cup final was something else, wasn't it? The World Cup final was Oh, my amazing. God. It really was. And it was coming into six o'clock in the evening here where the NFL was due to start and that's normally the time when we're settling in for six or seven hours of red zone with the Giants game on one TV and Colin will have his Broncos on another but that game was Do they televise Broncos games? <laughs> game they, pass. They do, they do for us <laughs> masochists LT, yeah. Okay. What was amusing during the World Cup LT was the, the, the interest from the States. Obviously we're listening to US yeah. podcasts daily with obviously for our teams and various different outlets, you know, your podcast, obviously, to Blue Rush, and yeah, I listened to Sports Radio New York, Wi Fan Radio, and as the, as the competition progressed, the interest in how the states were doing kind of kept getting better and better, and they were to a stage where people were actually asking whether they had a realistic chance of, of beating the, the Dutch, but they lost out to the Dutch, but it was, it was yeah. just, it's funny at times, people started off slowly, then really kind of get into it. Well, yeah, you know, we had, a, we, we should have beat England, we had tons of chances, we just couldn't score. Um, the Dutch were just a better side, way better side, actually. Um, but they're they're improving. They're very young. I think they were the second youngest team in the World Cup. Um, and a lot of young international talent, finally, with Musa and Pulisic and all these guys that are playing over in the EPL and La Liga and, you know, it, 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 Series A. It's just different times for the U.S. soccer. And we're hosting in four years. So I think it's created a little bit of a buzz for four years from now, because where I live in Kansas city, we will host uh, a few games from what I've been told. So uh, I can't wait for them to come back. And then there was a weird rumor that Ronaldo was this close to signing with sporting Kansas city. I don't know if you guys saw that, but that would have been crazy. Uh, I don't go to a ton of MLS games, um, but they do very well here. MLS is really growing. The MLS is, you know, selling out every stadium, every game, you know, the, the Atlanta team, they uh, they average about 55, 50,000 fans a game. That's that's pretty incredible for American soccer. I think I think Kansas City won out over a mile high in, in terms of being selected for the stage. Another another day in which Kansas City beats them. <laughs> <laughs> that's not fair. I uh, uh, LT um, Ireland beat England in the European Championships in '88, and it's still talked about here as as if it was yesterday, and. Uh, that's probably we talk about like the the look of the Irish and over the the summer months we got to talk to uh, we were fortunate to talk to Chargers GM Tom Tedesco we talked to Kevin O'Connell from the the Vikings and I suppose most importantly for this discussion uh, we talked to Joe Shane uh, when he was just getting his feet in under the the table and. Uh, obviously, all three of those gentlemen are with teams who are uh, in the, the playoffs. And um, Shane was really interesting, um, obviously um, stepping up from assistant GM to GM. But he talked about the importance of having um, dependable players, um, players who can contribute no matter what their status is, no matter what their previous NFL experience is. Um, and it was almost, I suppose, like he was forecasting the, the Giants season with the way things have gone with injuries and guys having to, to step in. How impressed have you been with um, Joe Shane and what he has managed to do, given what he inherited uh, from the previous regime? Yeah, it's nothing short of unbelievable, to be honest with you, because I think, including myself and all the prognosticators out there, that no one had the Giants winning more than six or seven games, I don't think. Um, but he's been able to bring guys in, smart, tough, dependable, right? That's their that's their motto. Joe Shane and Brian Dable is smart, tough, and dependable. You know, they picked up Isaiah Hodgins, who he drafted, who has come in and been a really good player for them in the last six, seven weeks, however long he's been there. He's a legitimate number two receiver. He's big. He's not super fast. 
Um, but just the, the parts they've added, you know, a lot of that secondary that played since Dory Jackson and McKinney went out, a lot of those guys, McLeod and some of these other guys, Pinnock, some of these guys weren't even on the team until the season started. So it's, it's a big, uh, you know, it's, you got to salute your salute the, the coaches. They, they've been able to come in Wink Martindale, especially on defense and get guys that have not been there very long to play well and play together. I think most importantly, so Joe Shane deserves a lot of credit for that. You know, he, he's always been known as a very savvy personnel guy. You know, everyone was clamoring for the Giants to sign Odell Beckham. You know, well, look what Isaiah Hodgins is doing. You know, he stood pat. He didn't do anything crazy. Um, and I think he made the right decision. Not that I don't think Odell Beckham coming back to New York wouldn't have been fun. But, of course, I just don't think he's ready to play. You know, he's, he had an ACL 10, 11 months ago. That's That's not enough time especially your second one for a guy to come in and contribute. So uh, really happy for, for the Giants. And obviously it seems like they've got the head coach and GM right for a change. It's been a while. LT, going into the season, obviously the microscope is under Saquon Barkley. He's coming back from a number of injuries. He's been kind of battle-tested whether he's in a position to come back and be so as effective as he was in his rookie year. And, a lot of them is question marks are down to injury, I would say more so than his natural talent. Um, on the other, the flip side, the quarterback, Daniel Jones, a lot of people felt with, with a, I suppose, a blank canvas and a new GM, a new head coach, that he wouldn't have survived and they would have looked elsewhere and potentially brought in a bridge quarterback for a year under the assumption that this season wouldn't be a good year and you'd be picking high in the draft come April when it's in Kansas City, your hometown. Um, Daniel Jones has done everything this year that has been awesome. I mean, his, his, you know, his turnover ratio has come completely down as compared to previous seasons. Uh, coming into off the free agency with so much money to spend, I know we're kind of getting maybe a little bit ahead of ourselves. So people are saying, wait and you see once he gets really good wide receivers in here. Like, is that necessarily worth doing? Because, you know, what, working now is so effective. Is it a case of let's continue as we are and run the offense based on what he does best? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, you still need a number one, though. I mean, you have to have something to to open up the field a little bit. I mean, this... This offense has a bunch of, you know, really they have a number two, maybe two of them, and him and Hodgins and Slayton, and then a bunch of threes. Richie James is a good player. Uh, but nobody that really scares you that you game plan against. There's no team playing the Giants that goes in and game plans against their wide receivers or tight ends. It's really Saquon in the running game and Daniel. So a wide receiver helps them in a multitude of different ways outside of, you know, you know catching a bunch of balls and, and yards. It's just it it's going to help them open up the offense a little more. Um, I said this at the beginning of the year, and I don't know if it was with you guys or the, my show. I said, you know, week one, the Giants would love nothing more than have tough decisions to make at the end of the year on Saquon and Daniel, and they have that. They have two really tough decisions to make. Do you franchise one? Do you let one walk? Do you pay both of them? Um, the cap's going up. They have cap space. But, you know, the Giants have some a lot of holes on defense outside of, you know, linebacker's a big issue, uh, middle linebacker. I'm not talking about outside and then the interior of the offensive line is playing really well lately. Um, they've only given up three sacks in the last three games, uh, two of the three, no sacks. So they're playing really well at the right time. And that's a great question. They they can continue down, but I still think you need a number one wide receiver. They're going to have to spend money in free agency or draft. In a way, the week one interception late in the game where David went over and voice his opinion directly in his face, similar to what he did with Slayton last week when he fumbled the ball. Yeah. I suppose that's been a kind of a, it, it probably would have happened at some stage, but it happened so soon in the season, so in week one, that was probably the best thing that could have happened. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a guy too, uh, people forget, you know, everyone wants to look at like the draft and free agency. The Giants have good players on their own roster that are on IR. They really do. And people, I think us as fans, we tend to forget about, Colin Johnson, 6'6", 230 pounds, who was literally going to be the Giants' number one wide receiver this season. He really was. He's a big, strong kid out of Texas. He was with Jacksonville. We signed him last year. He played a little bit. But he was really having an unbelievable camp towards Achilles. One of their starting middle linebackers that was penciled in was the fifth-round pick, and I can't think of his name right now, but they drafted him this year. They've got two linemen that they you know, drafted out of North Carolina that are both on IR. They've got a lot of – things in-house already so I if it was me and I'm guessing I think the Giants are going to go out and spend big money on a number one I think you'll still draft receivers to help out and build some depth but playing receiver I would go 
I would definitely go out and spend the money to get like a T Higgins, right? He's going to be available. Uh, the Bengals can't pay both him and Jamar Chase, but we'll see what happens. LT, um, I suppose my poor old Broncos, obviously, things haven't gone well this year. And uh, Nathaniel Hackett had made maybe the, the opposite decision to Brian Dable. Brian Dable made the decision early on that he was going to hand play calling duties to Kafka. And I just, that, that, as, as a, an English lit graduate, uh, the idea of Kafka calling plays is fantastic. But um, Hackett went down a, a different route. The Broncos are now on their third uh, play caller this year. And kind of just stepping back, though, from that, uh, uh, from your perspective as somebody who's played the game and, and won in the game, for fans, you know, a lot of the times on TV, we don't get insights into how coaching works and, and the relationship maybe between the head coach and the coordinators and the special teams and the entirety of the staff. I'm just wondering, in terms of the, the back, how, how important are coordinators and the backroom staff because obviously the focus is entirely on the head coach and obviously with the Giants this year it, it has been on Brian Dable he is front and center he is who we see we've talked about the emotion Brian has talked obviously there but like how how does it work with the the backroom staff as somebody who's been in there and, and done that you're talking about outside the coordinators yeah, or just I, coordinators? Just, co coordinator, wh how, however deep it goes, I suppose, it's just an interesting for, for fans because we don't generally get that perspective. Well, I, I think, you know, first off, coaching is the difference between winning and losing in the NFL. If you, it, The Giants roster is somewhat different than, than it was last year where they won three games. But to be honest with you guys, it's not completely revamped. It's not like they have a ton of, you know, Wanda, where all their draft picks are hurt and not playing outside of Kayvon Thibodeau. So – Coaching, and I tell people this all the time, it is everything in the NFL. Everyone's the same speed. Everyone's the same height. Everyone's the same strength. Which, What are your coaches doing to put you in a position to win or beat this you know, defense or beat this offense? Whatever the case may be, um, coaching is everything in the NFL, and I truly believe that. Um, offensive coordinators obviously are a big part of that. Your positional coaches, right? Quarterbacks have a coach. Receivers have a coach. Typically – uh, you know, Kafka is just a coordinator. Um, I'm sure he sits in the quarterback room a lot with with Daniel Jones and Tyrod Taylor going over the plan. But, you know, he's in front of the team every day, just like the defensive coordinator and the special teams coordinator. They're in front of their entire units every day talking about the plan. Um, but they're instrumental in winning and losing, in my opinion, in the NFL. I, I just always thought we had superior coaching under um, – Tom Coughlin. I just thought, you know, if you look around at a lot of those guys are head coaches now, that doesn't always mean that you have superior coaching, but just that's the difference. I, I truly believe that. Um, it's why Bill Belichick is always in it. He's always got a great staff, including himself, who puts his team in the right position to make the playoffs every year. Um, so I truly, truly believe in coaching. Um, we can all draft players and, you know, you look what Brian Dable has done with this team is what basically what I'm saying. I mean, there's not a lot of great talent, uh, you know, outside of Saquon and Daniel and Kayvon and, you know, maybe some some secondary players. But outside of that, guys, there's not a lot of people on that team that you would peg as surefire long-term contract guys or even, you know, pro bowlers. Dexter Lawrence, how could I forget him? He's played great. But, yeah, they don't have a lot of superstars. But it, it's funny because in 07 when we won the Super Bowl, we only had one or two, one or two pro bowl players, I think. And then the second Super Bowl we won – I think we had one, maybe two. Again, it was like Eli and Osi. It wasn't like we were this team built. You know, you look at the Eagles, they've got, what, 10 or 11 pro bowlers. The Cowboys have 8, 9, 10, 11 pro bowlers. Um, doesn't seem to always work, but those are the teams that are pretty easy to coach. LT, I have to ask you about the special teams. We, we were fortunate to have Graham Gano on the show last year prior, prior to uh, – prior to the Brian Dable reign, and he spoke very fondly of, of his time in New York so far, and he, how he's really settled into playing in, in the windy conditions that is MetLife Stadium. But he's been really good this season. I think with the exception of that one game against the Lions when he was actually ill, he's been really solid. It was more about Jamie Gillen because he's had a bit of criticism, in particular the second part of the season. He started off really good, and I was asking questions to other Giants fans why the Browns let him go. Obviously, it was evident we were moving on from Riley Dixon. But the second half of the season... He's had a few rough games. Obviously, the block punt in, in Minnesota, which in fairness wasn't wasn't really his fault. But there was a few games 
here and there where he wasn't playing really well. A good solid game on the Sunday night in Washington. But your thoughts on him throughout the course of the season? He's, been, he's for the pickup. He's done really well, with the exception of maybe the odd game. Yeah, I like Jamie Gillen. Um, he's had his issues, right? The drop snap. Thank God that wasn't a blowout loss. It didn't matter. Could you imagine if that was a tie game or something like that? The fact that it was a blowout game really helped the fact that, okay, I dropped a snap. It sucks. It happens. Um, but I think the thing you have to like about Jamie is he's left-footed. He's a big, strong man. He's big, physical. He just needs to work on his inside the 20 stuff, which he's gotten better at. Um, but you need a big, strong man to kick up in that part of the country because it gets – really cold and windy in the winter. And he's the guy I think, he, I still think he's only 25 years old. He's still young. Um, you know, I wasn't even in the NFL till I was 25, 26. I was doing the CFL thing, then made it. He's, this will be his fourth season. I think, I think he's just not, he's not a finished product. He's a young player. I think they like him. Um, he's had his ups and downs like everybody. Certainly the block punt against Minnesota was not his fault. Um, but overall I, I like Jamie and, and Graham Gano is, you know, he's better than good. He's he's unbelievable. Graham Gano is, is in Justin Tucker's stratosphere right now. And that's hard to say because Justin Tucker really had no peers uh, ever. But the last two or three seasons, you'd be hard bet pressed to say that Justin Tucker is that much better than Graham Gano. I mean, they're both in a class of their own. I mean, from, you know, what is he, eight and nine from 50 plus? Uh, that's crazy. Um, so he keeps he just keeps getting better and better. LT, obviously one of probably the, the most famous, famous moments of the 07 season for you guys is the, the fact that you played the, the Patriots in the last game and Tom put all of the, the starters out there. Um, slightly different probably for the, the Giants this year, but they did play the Vikings uh, just a couple of weeks ago and it looks like it will be the, the Vikings again in, in the playoffs. Similar sort of thing for the Vikes in that they brought in Kevin O'Connell, they brought in Kwesi as a, a GM in the offseason. How impressed ha have you been with the, the job that they have managed to do? Because by the sounds of things that came out over kind of the, the course after, um, late into the Zimmer um, rain and over the course of the summer, it seemed like it, was, it got pretty toxic in, in Minnesota um, last yeah. year. Yeah, it's very impressive. I like I said, I think anytime first year coaches come in, like a Dable, like a um, the guy, what's his name in Minnesota? I'm sorry, I just drew a blank. Qua uh, uh, Quasi is the the GM. The GM, yeah, Quasi. Uh, those two guys uh, and Joe Shane deserve a lot of credit for putting the team together and obviously hiring the right coach. Um, Mike Zimmer, I'd heard the same things that you heard. It got a little toxic. Him and you know, if your quarterback and head coach don't see eye to eye, it's, it, it typically never works out, right? We're seeing it right now with Derek Carr out in, in Las Vegas, right? That's going to end badly. He's gotten benched. And and you see it all the time when quarterbacks and head coaches do not get along, which Kirk Cousins and Zimmer didn't from all the rumors that we heard. So um, you have to be in lockstep with your head coach, and it seems like they are. Uh, what's the head coach in Minnesota's name? I'm drawing a blank. Um, Kevin O'Connell. Kevin O'Connell. Kevin O'Connell. Yeah, sorry. So quarterback, right? Former quarterback, offensive guy. Kirk believes in him. Kirk's playing great. Um, same thing with Dable. And, and, you know, obviously he's a quarterback coach by nature, offensive guy. Him and Daniel see eye to eye. It's really neat to see that. Um, these these new first-year guys taking their teams to the playoffs. And I think, but you know, I, I would say Dable just being a little bit of a homer as the coach of the year in the NFL. I mean, a team that won three games last year. Uh, and there's a lot of good candidates, but O'Connell would be one of them too. Yeah, and and just maybe um, one of the things that we saw, because uh, I, I think O'Connell has done a, a fantastic job, but one of the things that kind of emerged last week after the loss to the Packers was around the footwear uh, at Lambeau. And we saw Vikings players slipping here, there and everywhere. Now, you're a man who knows all about playing at Lambeau and uh, winning games at Lambeau. And we know Robbie Gould uh, approached you for advice even last year. I'm just wondering in terms of, is Lambo that different? Did did the Vikings players like underestimate it? Is that it would that be a concern that because we've heard Kevin O'Connell and some of the older or um the veteran players say they tried talking to the younger guys, but they didn't they didn't listen. Yeah, it, it's true. Um, you know, sometimes players get caught up in in consistency of their footwear that they want to wear. You have to always wear Coach Coughlin used to always tell us before a game, wear shoes that work. That very simply means go out to the field, 
in pregame and try on this shoe, that shoe, this cleat, this quarter inch, this half inch. Believe me, the NFL equipment staffs have everything you need. There is no excuse to be slipping, period. That's on the players. Like they can point fingers and say Lambeau Field stinks and all this other stuff, but the pro, you know, both teams play on it. So I've never been real big in the excuse making on footwear and slipping. When I see players slip, I automatically, some people will say that's unfortunate as a fan. That's just dumb. It's your fault. You need to be your professional athlete. Go get the right cleats and right shoes on. There's no excuse for slipping uh, on a field that's maybe a little slick because you can, like I said, these equipment managers and, and the teams, we have everything we need to be successful. So uh, that's just an excuse on the Vikings part. Um, that field is fine. You know, they have the coil system at Lambeau that warms the field to keep it from getting frozen underneath the the grass just below the surface there. So I think sometimes it can get moist, but again, there's really no excuses at this level to, to be slipping all over the field when you have all those resources available to you. LT, I'm glad you mentioned Tom Coffin and I'm, and I'm glad Cotton referred to you kicking winning field goals in, in Lambo because I'm in the <laughs> middle of reading this great book that's been written by Tom. There Coffin. it is. Your fortune to have him on your, your uh, the podcast recently. And as I said before we recorded, I can remember where I was for every game that season, uh, all those years ago, even on the second Super Bowl. But one thing I didn't realize, I haven't read through the book, was around the the player council in which Tom Coffin put together. And it was around the fact that he was trying to amend his ways of coaching and he put these councils together. You were obviously involved in the second one more so than the first time around. But can you speak to us about that? And obviously, we don't see head coaches like Tom Coffin around anymore. So it's a big no. transition to how it is. Today. No, they they so you know they just go to TikTok and social media. Um, you know, Tom was changing his ways, and people always ask, "Well, what was he like before?" And I always say, "Look, I don't know. I got there in 07 when he changed, so I don't have any relationship with him prior to that." But he started the the leadership council in order to be kind of like a conduit from, from him to the players. And he really let the players police the locker room, police the team. So being on that leadership council, you know, in 09 through 2012, not for this book, but I've been on the leadership council. Basically he has, he meets with us once or twice a week, typically once if things are going well. Um, and he wants to get a pulse of the team. And so basically when you go in there, typically on like Friday or, it was typically Friday. Um, he wanted to know how guys felt physically. Um, are guys tired? Uh, what's going on? Anyone having any problems? And it was really cool because it was such an open forum for us to speak to him and say, hey, coach, you know, so-and-so's, you know, got something going on at home. And he would take note of that, and like just understand maybe if this guy, you know, I thought it was brilliant. Um, but just, it was really just to get a gauge. And then he would also in turn though, if he didn't see things being done at practice properly, like in terms of effort or something like that, he would make sure he told us. So we would relay that information to the players because ultimately it was our team and he let us control that. And he let, you know, eight leaders, typically it was like three from offense, three from defense, and then two guys from special teams or whatever the case may be be his messengers. And I thought it worked out really well. Um, he can yell and do all that stuff on all he wants, but it's always different when it comes from your peers. You know, when a Justin Tuck is going up to a, a Jason Pierre Paul as a young player and saying, Hey, Jason, you need to get your shit going. Right. Coach is looking at you, thinks you're being lazy. Uh, that, that comes, that hits different for players coming from a peer than it does a coach. So I thought it was a great idea of his, um, they still have it as far as I know in New York. Um, and I think a lot of teams after hearing about ours uh, have leadership councils. So I think they're great. LT, maybe to ask about uh, one of your, your former uh, teams. And I, I know you're living in the Overland Park area. I've actually been there myself uh, many, many moons ago. I did. I dated a girl from Overland Park and visited no way. Uh, Kansas uh, many, many moons ago now, but uh, enjoyed it. Amazing barbecue. Um, but the, the Chiefs, under under Andy Reid, particularly in, in the regular season, they are a machine. They're phenomenal. And again, this year, even though in recent weeks they struggled, um, struggled against my, a bad Broncos team, struggled against the, the Texans, but they're doing enough. 
And I suppose just interested, like, do you do you see them um, having enough to go all the way to Arizona? Or is the fact that the AFC side of the draw is that little bit stronger than the NFC? Certainly, it would seem this year um, going to maybe catch up with them. Yeah, I listen, as long as Patrick Mahomes is your quarterback, I think you can win any single game you play. And he's definitely the MVP. I know there's been some Jalen Hurts talk and, you know, Jefferson, who kind of had a bad game last week. But absolutely, the Chiefs are – it's Patrick Mahomes, guys, and, and Andy Reid. And, um, the defense will shore itself up. I know people are saying, well, they haven't played well. Well, Steve Spagnuolo, who was our D coordinator in 07 – He's got the right guys over there. He's got Chris Jones. He's got some great players. They got great linebackers. Secondary is questionable, but if they get to play at home all three games, which depending on what happens with this Buffalo game, Bengals game, you know, it looks like right now, fair or unfair, it looks like the Chiefs are have home field advantage. I don't know how they're gonna the league is going to figure that out. Um, and we can talk about the DeMar Hamlin thing in a second, which was scary and unfortunate. And thank God all the reports coming out now are you know, that kid's a fighter and it looks like he's, he's doing pretty well. So thank the Lord for that. Um, but yeah, the chiefs can absolutely win it. And I, I, to be honest with you, I would pick them as my favorite. I know the Bengals have owned them in the last three, three games last calendar year, but I would never bet against Patrick Mahomes and Travis Kelsey. LTO, I'm just going to actually ask you about Monday night and the game. It's I've, we're probably going a little bit off topic, but the week that's in it, it's going to, the NFL is in flux in terms of what they're going to do with the schedule. And yeah. obviously, there's more important matters than football right now in terms of a, a player's health and his long-term diagnosis. Um, you watching the game on Monday night? Like it was it was two o'clock in the morning here. Colin, in fairness, stayed up to cover the game for the show on on Monday night, so he got to watch it live. And um, it was a bit surreal for anybody, whether you played the game or a fan. Uh, you know, in your, in your time playing the game, can you ever remember anything? Of experience, we see concussions. We see players get are down for a period of time, then they get up. But Monday night was something that is just unimaginable. unimaginable. We saw one recently, a couple of years back in the the Euros, where Christian Eriksen was playing for Denmark. Yeah, I remember well. Mm -hmm. it, it came up on a few US shows today. They didn't really knew, know who it was about, but we would. But it was similar in a way, but horrific to to watch an experience on TV. Scary. Yeah, I was sitting there with my wife watching and. We love, we love the NFL, right? It's been great to us. It's been great to our family. I love the sport. I love the game. I love all the players. That was that one just felt different, right? You, you saw him make a tackle, look innocuous. He stands up, and then he, the collapse is, was the scary part. And then the feverish way that the medical staff and players were acting, it just it felt different from the moment it happened. And you just don't see that. You, we've seen guys get knocked out. We've seen guys get concussions. You know, Matter of fact, Tua – on that field six, seven weeks prior to that was, you know, where his injury uh, happened in Cincinnati. And the poor fans of Cincinnati saw Ryan Shazier, you know, paralyze himself. Uh, it's, 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 it's ironic that all three of those things have happened in front of those fans in Cincinnati, but I was scared to death. And um, when someone starts doing CPR on a player, I know instantly that means he stopped breathing. That, that hasn't happened. Um, since I've been following the NFL, I know they said a player passed away in 1971 after the game, a Detroit Lions player. I can't think of his name, but that was different. Um, but, you know, you talk about Christian Erickson and you talk about DeMar Hamlin. And if God was watching him, there's only two places that you could probably have a heart attack or fall down like that and stop breathing and probably come out alive. And it's a soccer game and a football game where there's medical personnel just waiting for things like this to happen because I don't know, you know, we don't know the long-term prognosis of it, but everything that's coming out of Cincinnati right now and his family spokespeople are, he is doing well. And I don't know what well means. Does it mean he ever plays football again? Who cares? As long as he can just live his life again. Uh, this is a life story, not a football story, but definitely scared, you know, it's tough to sleep that night, obviously playing in the NFL. I think of that as a fraternity of mine and a brother of mine who I've never met. And he was just, you know, like Ryan Clark said it really well on ESPN. He was just living his dream. And, you know, to, the positives are, like I said, thank God it happened on an NFL field, you know, because I don't even think guys at practice, if that had that have happened at practice, there's just not the support system there medically 
that probably saved his life on Monday night. So everything just aligned there. Yeah, and and I think that like lessons were probably learned from from previous tragic incidents. I I mean I, I remember Mark Vivian Foy um, passed away playing for the Cameroon back in two thousand and three, a former um, Manchester City player, and I think it may be at that point sports uh, ensured that um, they did have the the medical personnel and. Um, you know, uh, we are very relieved and very grateful. Um, you know, even uh, I think the the only thing that maybe has been really great to see out of it is obviously the donations to Demaris Charity. But the fact that the NFL community from around the world has come together um, and uh, the outpouring of, of support, um, and, and hopefully he does continue to to get to get better. Um, LT, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering now that, um, you know, the, you, your Giants are, are doing pretty well this year and uh, Celtic are having a pretty nice season uh, as well. Have you been able to to keep up with the uh, happenings in the just, uh, Scottish Premier League? Yeah, just they had a ter- didn't they draw with somebody the other day? Not a good match. Some crack team <laughs> uh, too. They, I, they, I forget who it was. It was, it was a, late, a late equalizer is, is almost like a win. Oh, it was against Rangers. Games, so right? that's, you know, you just never want to you lose to Rangers. That's fine. Um but you know, Carter Vickers uh, plays for the U.S. as as a Celtic man, and a lot of good. You know, Maeda had a good World Cup, and the, I can't think of the guy's name that plays for the Czech Republic. Uh, uh, yeah, so yeah, the Celtic is. So I need to follow them more closely. Um, it's just the time difference. I don't know how you guys do the NFL being over there and all the games being the time zone there over here. I have no excuse because when they're playing, it's you know it's probably like ten in the morning here, so I should be able to follow it um but during football season american football season i just i'm so consumed with nfl football because as you guys know it's seven days a week the news cycle uh talking about your team waiting for the coach to speak and seeing who's going to play who's going to practice um i never thought i'd be that guy but here i am (laughs) and you you did get to play um internationally in in london right you you were part of the yeah. the giant team that came over what, the what first was game. that experience like kind of decamping for a week and and like what as like for the actual players like how does that work for your sleep sleep schedule how do coaches try to approach that yeah i think that it's changed since 07 because i, I want to say the giants only got there like a day before two days before something like that Friday um, morning. Friday morning. Friday morning and played yeah. Sunday. So we got there like a Thursday, maybe. So maybe just another, just a day earlier. We went right to Chelsea, right? As we landed, we went right to the practice facility for at Chelsea's place. Um, I loved it. It was, you know, Wem- Wembley stadium, 80,000 plus uh, the field sucked. The field was terrible. Um, grass. We tore it up. If you remember that game in 07, it was a mud fest. We won 10, seven against the dolphins and the dolphins were terrible. But the field was built for obviously 150, 160 pound soccer players, not 330 pound linemen. And um, we ended up, and it was raining. So the field was just getting destroyed throughout the game. And I remember being on the sidelines kicking, and the little Wembley field kick keepers were like telling me I couldn't warm up on the sidelines. And I was going, What the hell are you talking about? What do you mean? I, he goes, You're tearing up the grass, you're tearing up the bloody pitch. And I'm like, so what? This is my job. I'm going to kick here. Like these little Wembley field keepers were like telling us we couldn't kick on the sideline. I was like, uh, so I had to get like my security from the Giants to tell these guys to like leave me alone so I could warm up. Um, but the game has evolved, right? I know we missed each other in London this year, but um, I had a great time with my family, went to the Chelsea game. But man, what a different uh, scene being at Tottenham Stadium. That was incredible. What a place. Um, I had a great time, and obviously the Giants beat the Packers, so that made it better. Yeah, we, we replaced you with Brandon London for that live show that morning. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, he's he's probably a little better than I am. He's You know, Brandon is Mr. Media. He doesn't have a wife or children, so he can do whatever he wants. Well, Colm joked to me after that, after that game because we were in the media area, and obviously you're supposed to remain impartial in the media area. And as the game progressed and we got to the tour four quarter, it was all bets were off, and I was jumping um, around the media area. Let's put it. I wasn't uh, remaining calm. Let's put it like that. It was a great. What a energy. great stadium, man! Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, yeah. we. Uh, 
I don't think I've told anyone this publicly. We left like with 10 minutes left in the fourth quarter. <laughs> I was just trying to be traffic because in my head, I'm sitting there thinking, how am I going to get back? And how long is this going to take? Because I remember walking into the stadium and there was just, you know, I've never been, a, I haven't often been a fan. It, like in that scenario, like if I go to the Giants stadium, I'm VIP. I can, I have people like walking me in. There's no crowds, no lines. So this was a whole different experience. And I told my wife, I said, we're going to get stuck here for like three hours if we don't leave now. Um, so we left a little early and it was tough to catch a cab back to the hotel. Jeez. There was no cabs well, around. We, in the, in the pregame uh, show that we did with Brandon, it was very interesting LT because we were doing our uh, game picks and he picked the Packers and as the words came out of his mouth it was like a WWE wrestling moment license plate guy came running down like like, uh, something definitely like Hulk Hogan with the hair just all over the place and (laughs) called Brandon London out live on our show for for picking the the Packers it was one of those moments even as a non-Giants fan I don't think I will I will forget that definitely the hair going with license plate guy coming down probably the ultimate warrior i actually uh, that week picked the packers too just um uh, but that now license plate guy is going to arrive in kansas that's what's going to happen now. yeah here he comes um but and then me and brandon did a show that evening we have to do our post game show uh from london which was a challenge because um he was in you know he was he when he does all his talking even i don't know if you watched our show this week i mean he's he's busy at the stadium's emceeing and talking the whole time so he rarely and he talks all week on his sny show so he he rarely has a voice i don't know how he does it i felt sorry for him on monday show i don't know how he you should have left him off oh. this week giving him the even off yeah yeah um lt you've been very gracious with your time we really appreciate it hopefully um we have a deep playoff run and we'll, we might have you back on later on in the season no yeah listen i i listen they're a team that is is finally starting to believe in themselves I I really believe that you can watch them play now. And they, I don't think in the middle of the season that they thought they were very good. I shouldn't say that. I just don't think they've truly believed. And I think now they have a team that believes in each other and that's dangerous in the playoffs. Um, It'll be beneficial if they get the Vikings first over the Niners. That's for sure. (laughs) You don't want the Niners right now. No, they're very strong. We really appreciate your time. Hopefully yep. we can see you again soon. And no, I appreciate remainder. you guys as always, yep. and thanks for having me. Yep. Enjoy the remainder of the season. All right. Cheers, guys. See ya.